Before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called the Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. Tsar Paul I of Russia was unalived by some of his noblemen on March 12th of 1801. Before Paul I was unalived, he had written a letter. This letter contained information from the prophet of Russia, Abel, a man who is now known as Russia's Nostradamus. Paul made it very clear that no one was to open this letter until March 12th of 1901. And at that time, Paul's direct descendant, whoever that might be, who was sitting on the Russian throne, was then instructed to open it. When that fateful day came, Tsar Nicholas II, Tsar Paul I's great-great-grandson, along with his wife, Tsarina Alexandra, went to open up this time capsule, this letter. According to the servants that were there at the time, they were very giddy with excitement to see what was prophesied for Nicholas's reign. But when the couple came back to the palace, they were very despondent and distressed by what this letter had contained. This letter spoke about things that had happened after Paul I was gone, as well as after Abel was gone. Things that had come true, including the unaliving of Nicholas II's grandfather, Alexander II. This letter also spoke about the burning of Moscow, Napoleon's war and the Decemberist revolt that had happened with Nicholas II's great-grandfather, Nicholas I. But the most chilling of this letter was the prophecy that had been left for Tsar Nicholas II long before, over a hundred years before, Nicholas II would take the throne. This is what Abel had to say. The holy Tsar, who is like Job the long-suffering, he will have the mind of Christ, the patience and purity of a dove. A crown of thrones will replace his czar's crown. He shall be betrayed by his people, as was the Son of God. A great war will be fought. People will fly in the air like birds and swim underwater like fish. They shall destroy each other with stinking sulfur. Treason shall grow and multiply. In the eve of victory, the Tsar's throne shall fall. Blood and tears shall water the earth. A peasant with an axe will take power and the plagues of Egypt will begin. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a great big thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. Without you guys, this show would definitely not be possible. If you would like to join our Patreon or our producer community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce. And today, after many, many, many weeks of deep dives into the Romanov family, we're finally here. This is going to be part one of the Anastasia Romanov conspiracy. Around midnight of July 17th of 1918, the physician for the Romanov family 
was instructed to go and wake up Nicholas, Alexandra, and their five children. They were told that they were going to be moved to another location for their safety. They had been under house arrest for quite some time. And under the illusion of their protection, they were being brought to their own unaliving. Months before, in October of 1917, the Bolsheviks had taken control of the power of Russia. The Bolsheviks themselves were a terrorist organization. And unfortunately, their main target was the Romanovs. Once the Romanovs were led to the basement, they were told that they were going to be taking a photograph to prove to the people of Russia that they were indeed still alive. As they prepared for their photograph, they were read their death warrants. The rest, they say, is history. Or is it? Because ever since that fateful night, conspiracies have been swirling around the world, not just Russia, but the world, that there was a survivor, a lone daughter of Nicholas II and his wife, Alexandra. This was Anastasia Romanov. Now, personally, I can absolutely understand why this conspiracy would grip the minds of so many people. For starters, it's tragic to unalive children to believe that a child would have survived one of the most horrific nights of her life. I do believe speaks highly to our faith in the resilience of the human spirit. However, what I've noticed in the past few years is that this conspiracy has spun out of control. Now there's a group of people who believe that certain political figures are actually descendants of Anastasia Romanov. And for some reason, they, in their delusions, believe that these Romanovs are going to come back to save us. Now, as you guys know, in order for me to really try to understand what's going on within any type of conspiracy or any type of story, I have to start at the beginning. I want to look at all the spinning wheels in motion to understand what happened and how we got here. And I know, as well as you, that the law of one does speak of a pecking order being a negative polarity. So anytime there is a monarchy, a, a person born into divine right of rulers, anytime that we elevate a particular bloodline over another bloodline, we're looking at a satanic path. So I know inherently that any type of royal family isn't good. However, as I often say, we do have to look at individuals. Were the Romanovs as a whole good? No, they weren't. We've seen the psychotic antics of Peter the Great in this deep dive. We've looked at the wackadoo furniture of Catherine the Great and the potential trauma we saw in her son, Paul. We know that there were signs of actual SRA a-B-U-S-C, going on within the Romanovs. However, as I keep saying, we do have to look at individuals. And honestly, after doing a huge deep dive into Nicholas II, the father of Anastasia, I see a really, really good man. A really good man who was born into a system that we're all born into. And as I've said so many times before, two things can be true. The Romanovs as a whole were not good, but Nicholas could have been good. Does that mean Nicholas needed to say to stay the czar? No, of course not. The Romanovs did not need to be ruling anymore. But did Nicholas II deserve what happened to him? I don't think so. But regardless of the polarity of the Romanovs, the last czar, Nicholas, his wife, and his children, regardless of whether they were polarized negative or positive, for us to rely on them or some whimsical idea of them to come in and save us is us polarizing negative. And as I've said before, if there are people who we believe have passed away, who are actually alive, 
that's not really good for them, but that doesn't affect us as individuals because us as individuals have to save ourselves. So in discussing the Anastasia Romanoff conspiracy, I really, really hope that everybody who is invested in this conspiracy, that you evaluate why you're invested in this conspiracy. Is it because you want to believe in the resilience of the human spirit? Or is it because you want to believe somebody is coming to save you? Now, I do have an opinion on whether Anastasia survived or not, but I'm going to hold my opinion until part two when we get into the details of all the people who claim to be Anastasia Romanoff. But again, in order to really understand what's going on, we have to go back before that fateful night of July 17th, 1918, we have to again look at the Bolsheviks, look at the Romanovs, look at what was going on all over Russia at this time. Now, I'm probably not going to be talking a lot about R Rasputin in this deep dive because I've already done a huge deep dive into Rasputin. You guys, there is so much going on in this story. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to keep your eye on just one thing because there's so many spinning plates this was like the perfect storm no pun intended i know everybody's waiting for it, the storm that's not what i mean by that but it's just there's so much going on so much going on that you can't really pinpoint the cause of this effect of what happened on one particular individual because there's so many things going on. And so today we're really going to look at, again, the Bolsheviks, which we spoke about last week, as well as the Romanovs in the latter part of their lives. Now, I will place down in the description box below the deep dive that we did into Rasputin because Rasputin obviously did play a huge part into this. Um, we know from the law of one that Rasputin did polarize negative so he was in essence a mystic healer however he used his abilities for service to self not service to others so he did go negative to the service to self path um, versus service to others and we can definitely guess that Vladimir Lenin most likely went negative too so so doesn't take doesn't take a genius to figure that out so with that being said, let's go back. I want to start today with something we spoke about last time, which was Bloody Sunday. Now, if you're a history buff, you do know that there have been many events in our history that have been defined as Bloody Sunday. But the one that I'm speaking about today took place on the 9th of January, 1905. This was an event in which 3,000 to 50,000 Russian peasants marched upon the Winter Palace to petition Tsar Nicholas II. I know that's a huge gap, you guys, 3,000 to 50,000. But that's that's the information that's available. I mean, I wasn't there. That's I don't think any of us were there. If you were there during that time, um, as you are now, I don't care about past lives, but as you are now, Please let me know your vitality secrets because obviously anybody that was around at that time is not alive anymore. Uh -huh. Now, this was a protest or a strike that was originated by a priest named Gagori Gapan. And Gagori Gapan played the role of this man of God who was concerned about the poor peasants of Russia. Now, as we understand, understand it in our history books, is as the peasants were striking and protesting the human rights of what was happen, happening to most of the peasants of Russia, trying to petition Nicholas II without violence, they were just peacefully protesting. From what we understand at that point, the Cossacks, who were the military faction for the imperial family, opened i can't say the word on youtube but you guys know what i'm talking about on the protesters so with that being said this event that happened on this particular sunday as organized by this priest was literally the nail in the coffin for the romanoff family this is what really inspired the takeoff of the Russian Revolution in which 12 years later, the Bolsheviks would totally take control of the Russian government. However, however, 
as I was doing my research, I found out some things about this event that I find to be extremely fascinating. So we're going to talk about this a little bit before we get deep into the story, because I feel like this is important information for us to know, because we're going to see a lot of similarities between what happened then as to what's happening now. And as you guys know, if you've been following me along on this journey for a long time, the reason why I'm so fascinated by the Bolsheviks and the Romanovs and what happened is because it is eerily, eerily identical to what we are going through now. And as I've said before, just because the Bolsheviks were bad doesn't mean the Romanovs were good, right? What happens in the service to self side, the satanic side, is that they will fight each other. They will have fun fighting each other. So we have to get rid of this idea that that there are good guys and there are bad guys. Most of the time, they're both bad guys, all right, because there's no loyalty amongst amongst thieves. You know, on the positive side, we would never try to, like, fight each other or hurt each other. But that's not the true on the negative side. So let's talk a little bit about this thing that happened on this particular Sunday. And let's talk about Gapan, the priest that instigated this, because Gapan was born to a Ukrainian Kazakh and a peasant mother. Now, remember, I just said that the imperial family was guarded by the Kazakhs. And we're going to get deeper into who the Kazakhs were, because I find that fascinating as well. It seems through my research that this bloody Sunday can probably now be categorized as fake news. What do I mean by this? Evidence shows us that Gapan was a double agent. He was a member of the Russian secret police, but was also working with the peasants. So Gapan, again, was working both sides. And he knew that Tsar Nicholas II was not going to be at the Winter Palace that day. So Gapan was literally walking people to their deaths. You see, if you remember, Nicholas II's grandfather had successfully been unalived, brutally unalived. His father had had an attempt on his life because this revolution, this Russian revolution had been growing for about a hundred years. People were not super happy with the way the monarchy was ruling Russia and they were starting to push back. And so because of this, by the time Nicholas II took the throne, he had a lot of security. And so they weren't going to place Nicholas II in an area where they knew it was possible for him to be unalived. And so the fact that this strike or this protest was scheduled and getting amped up, they knew to remove Nicholas II, and Capon knew this as well. So he was literally leading people to their death. Now, at this point, too, in the Russian governmental system, to strike or protest was considered to be against the law, which is very, very wild for us here as Americans, because that's part of our First Amendment right, is to, like, peacefully protest. However, again, we're not looking at the same type of governmental structure. We're looking at a very autocratic, very, um, you know, power is held by one entity. That's the czar. So at this point, and I, I thought what was interesting too. And I saw this, I'm going to have to look at my notes here because I don't speak Russian, but I saw that you know, words mean something. So strike, that's the English word. We all know what that means to strike. Well, in Russia, the word for strike is stachka. Again, I hope I'm saying that right. Apologies if I'm not, I'm not Russian. Stachka comes from a word stachatsia. And stachatsia means to conspire for a criminal act. Interesting, right? Super, super, super interesting. So the Russian word from st- for strike literally means to conspire for a criminal act, which is not the same definition that we have here in the Western or in the English speaking world, I should say. So with that being said, just even in this, this environment, the people, the peasants that were willing to petition Nicholas II for better working conditions, for human rights, basically, were literally doing a criminal act according to their own language and according to their own government. Now, at this time, too, we spoke a little bit about this last week. We're coming into the 20th century, which by 1905, we're in the 20th century. Russia was still kind of living 
in this backwaters 19th century world. Again, Alexander II, Nicholas II's grandfather, had freed the serfs in 1861. So 20 million people were now free. They weren't working the land. And with that being said, though, their freedom came at a cost. At that point, once the serfs were let go, were let were freed, it became Russian law that the serfs then had to pay a tax. And this tax was going to go back to the nobles who owned the land because, you know, bless their hearts, these poor nobles were not getting the free labor anymore. And so we need to make sure that they're monetarily taken care of. So all you free people who don't have a pot to piss in have to know now go get extra work in order to pay the nobles back because you've now inconvenienced the nobles at this time because we're coming into the industrial revolution a lot of these peasants this serf class that was freed had to move from the farmlands where they had been living for generation tilling tilling the farms into the cities to work for factories and, and warehouses. It reminds me a lot of the child strike of 1899 that I covered a long time ago. I'll put that down in the description box below. It's the same type of workhouse environment. However, in Russia, the poverty was 10 times worse than it was over in New York where the child strike happened. They were having to live in houses with their animals. They had one room, they had nothing. They were literally living in, in destitute and working their asses off to try to pay back these taxes that have been imposed on them by Alexander II. Again, there was no, at this point, like human rights when it came to work environment, certainly no child labor laws like we have now. And so the people were asking Nicholas II in their petition to like cut him some slack, to give him a bit of a break. Now, from that side, I can definitely say, yeah, that was a peaceful, you know, they say that a lot of the peasants that came to the strike literally carried pictures of Nicholas II. They weren't opposed to Nicholas II being the czar. They just wanted open communication with Nicholas II so that their lives could improve. You know, one thing my dad used to say growing up that I think he was right about, he, you know, he's a veterinarian, he owns his own clinic, and he used to say, your business is only as successful as your employees are happy. Keep your employees happy, you keep your clients happy. And I think the same philosophy, theory can be applied here. The Russian country, the Russian empire was only going to be as strong as its citizens. And so if the czar made some accommodations for the people to give them a better life, then possibly the Russian empire could have become even more prosperous. But obviously, as the story goes, as they got close to the Winter Palace, the Cossacks on the people. This obviously left a very bad taste in the people's mouth all across Russia, even though the ones that weren't there. And so therefore, the power of the Bolsheviks got even stronger. And the Bolsheviks, of course, wanted to take down the Tsar with violence. And so this, what happened worked. It got the people to sway more towards the Bolsheviks. But again, this was all a setup. This was a setup by Gregory Gapon, the priest, who was also working with Lenin. That's right, Vladimir Lenin. So not only was he a double agent working with the Russian police, which was connected to the czar, but he was working and conspiring with Vladimir Lenin. Now, again, most of the peasants who went to this event were seriously just peacefully protesting. They wanted to come to some resolution with the government in order to make their lives better. They weren't looking to take down the czar. They just needed to be heard. Their voices needed to be heard. However, 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 they use the same playbook. I want you to think back to the summer of 2020 the summer of love, as they say, and please be careful in the comment section, the words you use, because once again, Big Brother is watching. There were Bolshevik revolutionaries that had been planted into this group of peasants. They were plants. And so as these group of peasants holding their little pictures of Tsar Nicholas II, just hoping to like have a conversation about making their lives better, as that was going on, these plants started to loot. They were armed. 
they started to break into people's houses, all hell broke loose. And so because of that, that is why the guard, the Imperial guards who were the Kazakhs had to then into the crowd. Does that make sense? I wish I could say more words that might make it make sense, but I'm trying to do the best I can to speak the YouTube language. It was all just one big setup. The his again, the history books want us to believe that the these group of just innocent peasants were just attacked by the Kazakhs because, you know, they were not, not inspired the Russian Revolution, but that's not the case again. The Bolsheviks had plants in the peasantry group to cause to cause the imperial guards who were the Kazakhs to hurt the peasants in order to piss the peasants off all across Russia so the Bolsheviks would gain more power. At the end of January 1905, Gapon left Russia and went to Switzerland where he met up privately with Lenin. For about a year, Gapon would work hand in hand with Lenin to spread the propaganda campaign against the the monarchy, against the Romanovs. And yeah, I mean, Lenin had information. I mean, Gapon had information, right? Because he was also, before he was found out to be a double agent, was also working with the Russian secret police. Now, in March of 1906, Gapon would meet his karma, his fate, when he would be unalived himself by the socialist revolutionary group so this event that happened on january 9th of 1905 on this sunday this is literally the turning point of everything this is what literally sealed the fate of the romanovs even though the romanovs really did not have anything to to do to do with this right this was all fake news it was a it was a false you know as as Catherine edward said the other day what people need to understand about the false flappy things is that people do get hurt on false flappy things it's just the person perpetrating the hurt is not who you think it is there's been some mind control there so people were hurt by this like literally this hurt people and the romanovs then became blamed for for what happened even though it was the bolsheviks who did this to their own people in order to sway power to scapegoat the romanovs now we do know in october of that same year the october manifesto came out where nicholas ii did try to work with the people but at that point the damage was already done he became known as bloody nicholas because of what had happened at the hands of the Bolsheviks. Now, I do want to touch a little bit on the Kazakhs because this group of people is super fascinating. And I know we had some questions about that over on Aquarius Rising Africa last week. Now, again, I want to remind you guys that just because a, a group of people might genuine, uh, generally be bad, like, you know, the monarchy might, might in general be a bad thing. Having a monarchy is a bad thing because it's a pecking order, it's elitism. No one should be born with divine right. That's not a thing, you know, and then the positive side. But with that being said, we also have to look at individuals because individuals can choose to polarize positive when they come from a group of people, even though that group might inherently be negative, if that makes sense. Well, the Kazakhs are no different, my friends. Now, I am going to be looking at my notes here, so please excuse me, because I want to make sure I get all the information I can out about the Kazakhs, just so we understand their role in this. Now, the Kazakhs were kind of like the Vikings in a lot of ways, although they came way later than the Vikings. They weren't specifically one group of people. Like, we can't say they were like Ukrainians or Russians or whatever. They were kind of a federation of, of a bunch of different kind of nomadic groups within this Eastern European area, just kind of like the vikings weren't just from denmark or or sweden or norway they were kind of that just that scandinavian group of people now we believe or historians believe that the kazakhs became and officially became a group around the year 1540 now yes i know you don't have to put it in the comments section i know people like to be contrary and they want to just make the youtuber look like an idiot and i, I say this every single video that i do a historical dive 
we know there are different timelines. We, I am fully aware that these dates might not be accurate. I'm fully aware that some of this history might not be accurate. With that being said, I think it's important for us to look at the narrative and then look at other narratives and hold both in our heads until we get the actual truth. Because remember, darkness can't create anything, only the light can create. So even within these historical narratives, there are going to be hints of truth. All right. It might not all be truth, but there's going to be hints of truth. OK. And for me, I'm, I'm not going to be walking around with my eyes wide shut. I'm not going to ignore the historical information they teach us in schools just because it might not be accurate. No, I'm going to try to look at everything, like literally everything so that I have better, better critical thinking skills. And I'm not just putting myself in a, in a position to follow the leader or play Simon Says. So. Before anybody wants to get contrary in the comment section, I'm not an idiot. Trust me. I know my IQ. I'm not an idiot. I'm very well aware. We've talked about that many times on this channel. I'm very well aware that there, this might not be accurate dates and this might, might not be totally accurate. But again, for those in the back who didn't hear, until we know for sure the for sure truth, I'm going to look at everything. Okay, because I don't want to have to do this circus ride all over. I want off this hamster wheel. I don't want to. I don't want to create any more karma to put me back here again. Okay, so anyway, all right. So according to the mainstream narrative, around 1540 is when they believe that the Cossacks really kind of became this unified group of independent federations. And Cossack means nomad. It simply means a nomad, like a gypsy, like you know, people that just roam around. And they, they they lived particularly in what's called the steep, which is an area of Eastern Europe that isn't hospitable. So this is kind of a no man's land. So they were able to kind of grow in their nomadic lifestyle because they were in an area that most empires didn't really want because it wasn't hospitable to human life or vegetation. And so they were kind of free to just survive out in this area. And of course, if they're living in a no man's land and they're surviving, they're obviously getting pretty tough and pretty smart themselves in order to handle it. By the end of the 1500s, these Cossacks became one of the most influ influential groups in Europe. Within the Kazakhs, there were many languages spoken, and at one point, they actually settled Kazakhstan, which is a very interesting country, if you know what I mean, which Kazakhstan translates to land of bandits. But we have some positive aspects to the Kazakhs as well, and this is why I'm, what I'm saying, guys, we can't just go around and tar everybody with the same feather or, or paint things black. We have to really look at things. We have to really look at individual people because, again, there were some positives to the Kazakhs. Now, we really see the positive side of the Kazakhs come out when they start to set up their villages. So by like the early 17th century, late late 1500s, early 1600s, the Kazakhs in this inhospitable no man's land do start to establish villages. Now, again, before this, they were more nomadic. Um, and when they started to establish villages, this wasn't so cool of them. They didn't have a lot of women. Like, like if you're going to have villages and you're going to have like generations, you kind of need women, you know, to, to have babies. This wasn't cool what they did. This was not cool. So they went, and the Vikings kind of did the same thing. Like the Vikings kind of, like if you're from Europe, like Western Europe, like myself, if your ancestry comes from Western Europe, you know you got a little bit of Scandinavian in you because the Vikings were going around just like impregnating all the women. So most people with European, Western European backgrounds have a good portion of, I know I do, I'm, I'm like 3% Scandinavian or something because yeah, that's the Viking blood that everybody's got in Europe because they were just going around everywhere like planting their seed you know and so what what the but what the vikings did is they kind of went out and planted their seed what the Kazakhs did is they went and trapped women from other villages caged them like animals and brought them back to their towns you know to be their wives so you can call that carpooling that's our word for the t word if you want wasn't so cool that they did that. I'm kind of laughing because I just can't imagine like 
you're a woman going about your day and then all of a sudden like you're in a cage and you're being like brought down the river to to some like I mean, the good. I, I'm, I'm kind of being facetious here because that was not good and it's traumatizing. But I was about to say the good thing is the Kazakhs did work really hard. They understood physical health. The Kazakhs would actually train their bodies. You know, back in this time period, we don't see a lot of like, you know, there's no gyms. It's it's like people are playing games and sports and jousting, but but it's more sportsmanship. There wasn't a total understanding on um, exercise and like working out and keeping the body at an optimum level, but the Kazakhs didn't know that. And so that, in that respect, they were, um, they were ahead of their time. And it probably came from survival in this no man's land. They, they figured out that they, in order to survive in this no man's land, they needed to keep themselves in top physical condition. So the Kazakhs were really the first people who started working out just for the sake of working out in order to condition themselves versus just going and jousting for, for sport. And so I will say with the women, at least when they got uncaged, at least their man had a six pack. I don't know, silver linings. Anyway, but once they had gotten women, a few generations had passed and now women were integrated into the Kazakhs and they had these villages set up. They actually gave the women a, a lot more rights than other neighboring states. I mean, when the men were away, um, by doing whatever they whatever the Cossacks were doing, the women had total control over their villages. And this was absolutely not the case in Europe. And when women, when men would come back, the Cossacks even had this saying that your wife should be your best friend. If your wife is your best friend, you're a powerful man. So the Cossacks, even though they did shitty stuff, like stole women, a few generations down, they actually treated these women better than any other neighboring community. So I thought that was like super, super, super interesting. Now, because the Cossacks became so powerful, a lot of the Russian nobles, because they backed up on the Cossacks area, would have to like work with the Cossacks. Now, the Cossacks were not wealthy like the nobles. They definitely were more around the peasantry line of Russian civilization. But the Cossacks would never, they held their head high. Like they would always, they spoke to the nobles like the nobles were equals to them, which the nobles were not used to because the peasants never acted that way. And so there was this huge animosity for a long time between the nobles and the Cossacks because whenever, whenever they had to work with the Cossacks, the nobles were like shot, like shook it that these Cossacks were, were treating the nobles like the nobles were equal to the Cossacks. I mean, that's kind of funny to me. That's spicy and interesting, right? Now, the Kazakhs, even though they were not as wealthy as like the nobles or the landowners, they were really good horsemen because of living in no man's land, and they were both good on water. So militaristically, they were a force to be reckoned with. And so as time went on, that is why different states wanted to form alliances with the Kazakhs. Because I think most states knew that if they were to challenge the Kazakhs, the Kazakhs would kiss their kick their ass. Like there's no there's no question there who would win that battle. The Kazakhs also believed in democracy, which is another good element. They believed that the leader of a village should be voted by the people that they didn't believe in divine right. They didn't believe that someone was just born into power. They believed, again, in democracy, which is more of the um, polarizing positive, where you elect somebody who you think is the best person for the job. And then oh, after, the, the leader only led for like a year. So they had they had term limits, guys. They had term limits. So a leader would lead for a year and then he would step down and a new leader would be appointed, which to me is amazing. I mean, maybe a year is a little too short for someone to get the work done, but I think I think we do it pretty good in America with four-year terms. Um, and hopefully when things get righted, that might actually be honored in a, in a lot of ways um and they would they would vote the reason how they would vote for people i find this hysterical and a lot of groups did this the groups that practice like the vikings practice more democracy they would figure out the winner by applause so whoever got the most applause was the person who won so i guess in that way you can't have any cheating 
right? Like everybody's in the town square and they just scream and shout for the person they want to be their leader. Now, at the beginning of the Kha'Zix, everything was pretty equal, but as we know, things get corrupted here on planet Earth. And by the mid-1700s, we start to see divides in the Kha'Zix community where we have elite members and we have peasants. So some of the Kha'Zix had become wealthy from deals they did with the nobles for whatever reason. Start Some of the elite started to get job offers in Moscow. So they started to travel. I mean, Russia's right there. It's just like me going to Alabama. Like it's, it's same proximity to where they were. And so where are they getting these job offers in Moscow? They're getting more business deals. They're networking. And so we start to see more of the Russian culture integrating into the Kazakh culture. At this point, uh, the Imperial Guards, because the Kazakhs were so good at surviving, at being on horseback, of, of, of handling really hard areas, they started to offer the Kazakhs, the elite Kazakhs, business deals and basically offering them to work for the military, to, to protect the czar in exchange for a lot of money and come over to the Russian side. So over time, all of these Kazakhs started to merge in with the Russian culture. Now the poor Kazakhs became serfs. They were sold into serfdom before they were freed in 1861. So the Kazakhs do play a pretty big role in what happens. There's a huge divide now. The Kazakhs most of them, the elites, are guarding the czar. That's how they became powerful and became wealthy, while their friends and family, their descendants, are living the slave's life and now are forced to be these peasants that are just being, just living this horrific existence in these cities during the Industrial Revolution. So it's interesting. So when we see that the Kazakhs were the ones that into the peasantry group, you know that there were other Kazakhs within the peasantry group. Fascinating. We know Gapan himself, again, his father was a Ukrainian Kazakh. Mother was a peasant. So interesting. Somebody had asked about that, so I thought that I would I would share that with you guys. The, the Kazakhs still today, I was looking on, there's a website for Nicholas II, and they the Kazakhs still get into their garb and they go and honor some of these monuments like Alexei. They just put a monument up for Alexei, Nicholas's son, um, that the Kazakhs were honoring. So it's still very much a part of, of a, the Russian culture. But again, for those who are not familiar, it's just kind of, they were, they were kind of like the Vikings, right? They kind of bled into Russia and Eastern Europe the way the Vikings bled into Western Europe. All right. So let's get back to the Romanovs. So again, January 9th of 1905 was definitely a turning point for the um, Romanov family. And from then on, things just kept going downhill quickly. Um, the Romanovs have been in power since 1613. And we could see 300 years later how the power of this family was losing its power, we could say. And it is true that the Romanovs did take, in this 300 years, they did take Russia from a backwaters state, hillbilly, broken down empire, into one of the strongest empires in the world. But unfortunately, by the time Nicholas II came to the throne as the Tsar, he was damned if he did and damned if he didn't. There was nothing this man could do that could stop the the avalanche that was heading towards him again this resentment towards the czar had been building and snowballing for at least a hundred years now and again outward appearances say a lot the 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 czars the romanovs were living in opulence i mean hello have you seen some of the russian palaces they were unbelievable they make versailles look like a shack and the people right a mile down the road were living in squalor and filth. And so there definitely was an uneven balance of wealth within the country. On July 28th of 1914, World War I begins, which we do see reference to World War I in Abel the Prophet's letter. 
Nicholas, bless his heart, who is trying everything he can to to fix the situation in his country, decides that he needs to go and be with the Russian troops. Russia was part of the Allied forces, so they were allies with the United States, with Great Britain, most of Western Europe against the German and the Ottoman Empire. So he's he's trying the best he can. He's going to go be with the troops. He becomes the commander in chief. Now, for a while, Alex did gain a little bit more popularity with the Russian people just for doing that. But it quickly started to wane as the death toll started to rise, as it does with, with any war. Now, we also have a problem with his wife. We've seen this problem before. Because there's always been a little bit of a struggle between Germany and Russia. Alex, his wife, was born a German princess. So when Nicholas II was gone with the army, Alex, the wife, the Tsarina, took more power into her own hands in running the government. And a lot of people started to become suspicious of her. Not only was she hobnobbing with this crazy priest guy named Rasputin, but she's literally German born. And Germany is the enemy of Russia at this time. By early 1917, Alexei, their son who struggled with his health, who had hemophilia, ends up getting the measles pretty soon as what happens with most siblings. I think my sister and I had the chicken pox at the same time. His sisters then get the measles. And so what we're seeing with, with Alex and her children, and this, this is something that I find pretty sweet about the Romanovs. Like if you take away the title of czar and czarina of, of, of royalty, Nicholas and Alex, compared to most royal parents, are heavily involved with their children. Heavily involved with their children. They really love their children. They really loved each other. We know that Nicholas and Alex, it, they, they were not really an arranged marriage. In fact, we know Nicholas's parents really didn't want him to marry Alex, but he loved her. So they truly loved each other. And I think that's why they had such a bond with their children. We know that they were struggling to have a son, but it is said through some of the papers that I read that Nicholas was totally fine with being a girl dad. You know, he was a hashtag girl dad. Like he had these four daughters that they said he just adored his daughters. And Anastasia especially had a special bond with Nicholas because she was kind of a little tomboy. And she, you know, at this time, early 20th century, these girls were raised to be prim and proper. They were going to be married off to other royals. But Anastasia, it seems, liked to go outside and get her knees dirty. And so her father took a special bond to her because he would play with her outside. I mean, I just, the more, I, you know, taking away the Romanov title, the czar title, I really like this family. And I do see Nicholas II sec as being like a hashtag girl dad. He, I see him as being the type of dad. I know Barbie didn't exist back then, but I think he would totally sit down and play Barbies with his daughters and help build that Barbie dream house and do tea parties with them because he just, it was more the wife that was stressed about having a son in order to have an heir to the throne. And as I said before, I think because of the prophecy in this letter, I think there was even more stress on them to try to break this prophecy by perhaps having a son. But we've seen it before. We saw it with Alexander I, who was his great-grandfather's brother, who passed the throne to the brother because he didn't have sons. And we know that Nicholas had brothers. In fact, he tries to advocate to one of his brothers. So it wasn't super, it wasn't a super emergency that they didn't have a son. I think it was just them wanting to try to stop the prophecy. But nonetheless, once Alexei was born, he obviously was born with hemophilia. That's what opens the door to Rasputin coming in and Rasputin able to heal. Alexei and so Rasputin then through his spiritual manipulation is kind of controlling the family and by way of controlling the family is kind of controlling the government and he's sending Tsar Nicholas II advice on the front line while he's hanging out with with um, Alex and the kids and I do believe I know I said that in the deep dive with Rasputin again I'll tag that down below that he was doing and i believe in my opinion that he was doing very inappropriate things with the daughters i don't i don't know if the parents knew i can't i don't think they did because again nicholas was off with the soldiers so i just and by the way they love their children i just don't know if that would have been acceptable so 
anyway, but when Lexi gets measles, of course, this is scary because he's got hemophilia. So this could make any sickness, any scratch, any, any scrape knee 10 times worse. But like most siblings do, he passes the measles on to his four older sisters. They all end up having to shave their hair off through the treatment of the measles, which for a little boy is probably not that big of a deal for a woman. That is very upsetting to have to do that. But the Tsarina, even though she was the Tsarina and with most royal families, we see them passing their children off to nannies. And I know they did have nannies and stuff, but we do see the Tsarina actually actively involved in caring for her children. So as her husband's away with World War One, she's kind of regent for the country and now she's kind of stepping back the people already hate her because she's german born and now she's kind of playing regent and now she's stepping back to be mom to be the mother and take care of her children it's just there's so much going on the bolsheviks are getting stronger i, I really believe that lenin kind of used world war one too as an entryway into really taking control of the russian people because there's just so much chaos everywhere while russia is engaged in world war one it's also engaged in its own revolution i mean when it rains it pours so when nicholas ii hears that his children all of them are sick with the measles he decides he needs to go back to his family he's not really on the battlefield anyway he's just there with the troops and so he arranges to go back to his family although while on the train heading back home the train gets stopped by some revolutionaries. And so his plan to go home gets derailed. Around this time, Nicholas II decides that it's probably best for the country and for his family if he abdicates. Now, to me, that's a completely service to others thing to do, to surrender, to, to put others' needs before yourself. And so March the 2nd, he does make this statement that he's abdicating in favor of his brother, Michael. His brother, Michael, though, however, refuses to take the throne. And we do have some of Nicholas's journal entries about this. Nicholas goes on to say, the bottom line is to save Russia and keep the army at the front. I need to make this step. And so for me, as someone who is a student of the law of one, trying to piece together the polarity in these situations, that was a pretty positively polarized act. To understand the significance, the people don't want a czar anymore. They don't want him, he thinks. So he tries to give it to his brother. His brother declines. But at this point, he's literally abdicated. So at this point, this is the end of the monarchy. The monarchy is done. It's not coming back. I don't know if they knew it wasn't coming back, but the Romanov line is done. So we have this revolution going on where the Bolsheviks are maintaining power. The czar has abdicated. So besides the prime minister who kind of works with the czar, there's really no government. The government's kind of in free fall at this moment. And since we have this, these Romanovs, the, the czar, the ex-czar and the czarina, what are we going to do with them? Like, I've thought about that before with the British monarchy. Like, if, if King Charles were to, like, come tomorrow and be like, you know what, guys? Game's over. We're going to, we're not going to be the kings and queens anymore. We're just going to totally allow this to be a democracy. And we're going to step back and we're going to turn Buckingham Palace into a museum for history's sake or whatever. And we're just going to kind of be one of you. Just be one of the citizens of this country. Like, what would you do with them? You know, like, what... We, I don't, you know, I don't advocate like hurting anybody, but like, do you think Prince William could just go get a job as an accountant? Like, it's kind of a, kind of a, a quandary, right? Like what, how did, how, where are they going to go? You know, and, and how do you set them up with, you can't just, I don't know. It's, it's just, it's a, it's an interesting predicament to be in. And this was the predicament we see with the Romanoffs. Now I mentioned before that King George V who is on the English throne at this time, is both Nicholas II and Alexandria's first cousin. So they know that stuff's not going good for them in, in Russia. And so they do reach out to their cousin, George V and Nicholas II looked identical, by the way, asking for asylum in England. And there's lots of like conspiracies around this too. Some people say that George V at first was like, absolutely, your family will get you over to England. It's no big deal. 
and then he reneged. Some people said he reneged from the get-go, but we know that that never happened. And a lot of people justify George the fifth making this decision because this wave of revolution was literally kind of sparking all over the world, this Marxist. And he was very concerned that if they brought the Romanovs to the United Kingdom for asylum, that it would spark the same type of revolution in the United Kingdom. And George V did not, obviously did not want that happening. Also, we need to be, he, he felt like he probably needed to be focusing on the war effort, World War I. But at the end of the day, his cousin, their first cousin said, no, I'm not saving you. I can't imagine personally how that would feel. Like we can sit here and analyze it politically and perhaps maybe understand politically why George V did not save his cousins. But emotionally, I can't imagine. Like if I rung up one of my first cousins, especially my mom's side, because I'm super close to my cousins. They were like, grew up like my siblings and said, I need help. I cannot imagine them saying no. Like I would never say no to them. You know, like I can't imagine how heartbreaking that would be. And at this moment for Nicholas II, looking at him as a husband and as a father, I want to cry for him because I can't imagine, I can't imagine what he was going through. You know, he was born into a negatively polarized system. He became the czar. But at what, what, at what point, you know, can, do we have a level of forgiveness because this is how, you know, how does one then, especially for a son, Say, no, dad, I don't want to be the czar. I'm just going to go be a lawyer or I'm just going to go be a farmer. We saw that with Alexander the first that he just wanted to like live his life. He didn't not want to be the czar. And so like, at what point do you, do you deviate from what you feel like is your responsibility, your family responsibility, your karma, if you will. And at what point do you, express your own will? I don't, it's, it's, it's such a complicated situation. And sometimes especially when we're looking at the law of one and the polarity, we have to just really understand that things are, are complicated. They're complicated. I mean, I was talking to my boyfriend about this just today. My boyfriend is a direct descendant of Sir Thomas More, who wrote Utopia, which I find really fascinating. And we were talking about Sir Thomas More's unaliving by the court. He was hung, drawn, and quartered. And I was asking my boyfriend, I was like, you know, he he ended up having that happen to him because he refused to accept Anne Boylan as the queen. So is that a negative polarity though, not to save yourself? I don't know. It's so, we both agree. There's, it's just complicated. It's so freaking complicated, but it's interesting to, to talk about these things and, and we don't have to have an answer because that's, you know, luckily for us, that's Nicholas the second's path. It's not ours, but just to take, these stories and learn from them and help better our, our own selves. But nonetheless, I digress. I just have a lot of empathy and compassion for Nicholas II as a human being, as a father, as a husband, somebody who was handed a country and is trying what appears to be trying his best against all odds to do what's best for the country and for his family. But nonetheless, by the spring of 1917, the Romanov dynasty of Russia is done. The monarchy itself is done. And the imperial family, Nicholas, his wife, their four daughters, and their son are put under house arrest. But before we get into the final days of the Romanovs, just a brief word from our sponsors. I am so fortunate to have such great sponsors on this channel. Our sponsors, as well as our patrons, are the people who keep the lights on here at Esoteric Atlanta so I can continue delivering videos to you multiple times a week. 
I am so lucky to be a part of Gnostic TV, to have ASEA as a sponsorship, and to now be sponsored by the incredible Spooky 2 company. Spooky 2 is like a Rife machine generator to help you in your journey through this human experience. If you want more information on Spooky 2 and what it can do for you, there will be a video down in the description box. If you would like to purchase Spooky 2, there are a few different discount codes that you can do, all of which you can, again, find down in the description box below. For the 11 year anniversary of Spooky 2, for particular products that are listed for the anniversary sale, you can get 9% off of these said products by entering Happy Bryce in checkout. For all additional products, the regular products, you can get 5% off by entering Bryce Watson when you check out. Here is a little clip of what Spooky 2 can do for you. Hi, John, Echo, and the Spooky 2 team. This is Kanika here, and I'm here to share not just my and my partner's Spooky 2 journey. Spooky 2 has been superbly special for my partner and I. I'm actually sitting in the scalar field. In our personal experiences, my partner and I have uh, literally gone off all our, our vitamin and multivitamin multivitamin and mineral supplements we hardly take them we used to take them to support and supplement our well-being but i've been using the daily wellness protocol and my hair has just exploded in its growth the skin's gotten uh, beautiful the dh experimental frequencies i've been experimenting with a lot of them we have such good strength in our body we don't fall ill to an extent that my partner has hay fever peter he has hay fever but this time i've started using the immune super booster and oh my god it is magic uh we recently this year purchased the remotes as well so we use our dna clipping and we put our clippings in it and uh it's just been so beautiful and profound and I have always been, so I pray daily, I meditate daily and I've been sitting in the scalar field and meditating and praying and my psychic abilities, my connection to the divine, if I just want to put it in a nutshell, is just increasingly becoming so potent. I've been using the 12 strand DNA activation as well and the DH experimental frequencies just to see how it goes and the the effects are so magnificent in our, on our physical bodies and our like um, energetic field. I'm an energy healer. I take clients through um, quantum healing sessions while sitting in the field so that they can also I can be a clearer conduit and send these energies as well by pure quantum entanglement right and if people were to not believe this all this physical proof shows what a gem of a product this is i can't like recommend this more to anybody like so yes much love and gratitude thank you for listening and um uh, I could share so much more, but I'd like to wrap this up now. Thank you. At first, the Romanovs were placed under house arrest at Alexander Palace in St. Petersburg. So they're kind of in their own home territory. Just kind of like locked down. Uh, again, I, I know that... They must have been super stressed out, but trying to keep the moods up for the children so the children don't panic. They do have about 45 servants that are allowed to stay with them, including the personal physician for Alexei. After George V declined to help his cousin in August of 1917, they are moved a thousand miles away to be put under stricter house arrest to a town close to Siberia. I think at this point, it's pretty apparent to us, if not to Nicholas II, that Abel's predictions, that letter he read back in 1901, is absolutely coming true. 
A few months later, in October of 1917, the Bolsheviks take full control, full power of the Russian government. Once the Bolsheviks were in total control and power, the Romanovs were moved again to a house called the House of Special Purpose. This is a pativ, hope I'm saying that right, a pativ in Russia. Now, something that's very interesting that somebody actually pointed out in the comment section of another podcast that I listened to in researching this story. In the very first de deep dive I did into the Romanovs, preparing for this conspiracy, we went all the way back to Michael Romanov, the first ever Romanov ruler. He was placed on the throne after the times of trouble by th through his aunt, his aunt who had been married to the previous Ruik Tsar, and her name was Anastasia Romanov. And I thought it very interesting that the Romanovs started with an Anastasia and ended with an Anastasia. Now, what I didn't know, but looked up afterwards after this person had left his comment, was that Michael Romanov, the original ruler back in 1613, had been living in a monastery of the same name, Ipativ, Ipativ Monastery. So the Romanov rule started with an Ipativ, and the Romanovs ended in an Ipativ, a house called Ipativ. If that's not karmic full circle, then I don't know what is. But nonetheless, they were moved to the Apatif house, the house of special purpose, where they were really, really scrutinized and watched. At this point, only four of their servants were allowed to come with them to this house. Of course, one of them being Alexei's physician. The windows were covered with newspaper. They hardly got any fresh air. They were rationed by the food. They were literally treated horribly. Now, it is said through a lot of journal entries that we have to study of Nicholas II that we do believe that during this time, the Romanovs remained pretty respectful to their captors. We know that they instructed their children to remain respectful. But we also know something else, that as the Romanovs were being moved from house to house to house, they took with them a lot of their diamonds and their jewels. And the girls would spend the nights basically sewing their jewels into their bodices, into their, their, cors their corsets. You know, I mean, we're in the early 19th century, so clothing is definitely changing. But they are able to, because of corsets, because of slips, because of the the, the the attire that they wore, they were able to hide a lot of their jewels within their own clothes. And they would stay up at night stitching diamonds into their clothes. We believe that this was done because they felt at some point they would be freed and they would be able to use these valuable items in order to establish a new life for themselves. So, you know, I, I, I don't know if they... If that was just some cognitive dissidence, I think most of us, you know, of course, we're not emotionally in this situation. So I think sometimes when you're an emotionally in a situation, sometimes you cling to hope because it's all you have. But I think most of us, even though we know what happened, are like, nah, you ain't getting out of this alive. Like, this is not this is not going to work out the way you think it is. But nonetheless, them sewing their jewels within their bodices are going to become really important when we talk about the probability of one of the children surviving. Obviously, they had been at this house for a few months by this point. And at midnight that night, again, the physician was awoken by the guards, the Bolshevik guards, and told to go wake up the family to tell them they were going to be moved again. They were instructed to bring the family into the basement. Once in the basement, they told them they were going to take a picture of them, a family picture, to assure the Russian people that they were still alive. As they lined up to take the photo, the guard came in and read them their death warrants. Now, again, these were Bolshevik revolutionaries who were acting as guards to the Romanovs. They were not highly trained military men. In fact, most of these guards were just picked up from the surrounding towns of Siberia. Most of them had never had any type of, of gunmanship training. They were not marksmen. Um, we know that when the guards were made aware, they were going to have to 
unalive the family that a lot of the original guards backed out because they just absolutely could not do that to children. We have record of that. And I think it took them a couple of rounds of finding people who would actually do the job because so many of the people in that area just wouldn't do that to a child, which shows me that there at least there was some humanity within some of these Bolshevik members that they didn't have a problem with unaliving the czar because they they blamed the czar for everything. But when it came to his kids, they were a little bit like, I'm not doing that to a child. This is your children. These are children, you know. But nonetheless, they finally got the amount of people they needed to get. And they came down to the basement and they read the family, their death warrants. Now, we know... We know that Nicholas was unalived really quickly because all of the marks, the, the, the not, well, they weren't marksmen, but trying to watch what I'm saying. A lot of the dudes that were in the basement with them had their, we'll call them their toys, their toys facing towards um, Nicholas. They all had their eyes on Nicholas. And so he went really quickly. Like he didn't suffer that much. We know though that it took a long time for the rest of the family and the four servants to be unalived. We know that because of the jewelry that was sewn into their corsets, that a lot of the toys, uh, the balls that come from the toy, if you know what I'm saying, ricocheted off of some of the jewels to the point where once they were injured enough, the men had to use bayonet to finish the job, which to me is just so unbelievably grotesque. <sighs> so at the night of their unaliving, Nicholas was 50 years old. Alex was 46. Olga was 23. Tatiana was 21. Maria was 19. Anastasia was 17. And little Alexi was 14. Now, for a long time, the world was not aware of what had happened to the Tsar and his family. Pretty soon after this happened, we had the closing of the Iron Curtain. The USSR was in the process of taking its grip over Russia. People in Russia were being stripped of even more of their rights. Everything that makes a person's life worth living was taken from the Russian people, religion, spirituality, everything came up, became about the people being of service to the state. So they went from one person, one family they thought was tyrannical to an even worse tyrannical government that literally gave them no ounce of humanity whatsoever. With the Russian people hell-bent on just surviving through communist communism, we literally, those of us outside of this world, were given no information about the Tsar and his family. People figured out pretty quickly that Nicholas was no longer with us, but they weren't sure about the children. It wasn't until many years later where we had the first person claim to be the missing Anastasia Romanov. We will cover the imposters, the likelihood of Anastasia surviving this horrific night and where the bodies were eventually found on next week's episode. But just know that because of the diamonds in the corset, there's always been a possibility that someone could have survived. There's always been a possibility that while the bodies were being carted in a wagon to be dumped, a guard who had some humanity left in and heard the whimpering of one of the children, it's possible that he then picked that child up and rescued her and got her out of Russia. It's possible. It absolutely is possible. But did that really happen? Again, we'll cover that next week.